All right, hello and welcome to this evidence video capsule which covers the topic that I like to refer to as legal advice privilege. You'll hear it referred to by many different names, including solicitor client privilege, lawyer privilege, the use of terms go on and on and on. It doesn't really matter what you call it because what we're talking about today is the most important privilege there is in the judicial system. Now let's explain exactly how it works and what it's designed to protect. Now, very briefly, before we talk about legal advice privilege, I want to point out some obvious things about privileges generally. Unlike most of the rules we've studied in these capsules, they're not based on probative value and prejudicial effect. In fact, evidence excluded on grounds of privilege is generally regarded as extremely probative. We exclude it anyway. And for every privilege, the reason is the same, because there is a competing social interest that's strong enough to warrant excluding the evidence. And it's for that reason that the laws governing privilege probably vary more by jurisdiction than any other law. You go around the world in common uh, law countries, you'll find most of the rules we've discussed uh, in these capsules. But the laws governing privilege do tend to vary quite a bit more because different countries and different jurisdictions measure or value certain interests more than others. But every country respects the importance of legal advice privilege. So we're going to divide the discussion here into three specific categories. First, I'll briefly outline the interests that the privilege is designed to advance. Then we'll examine some of the more technical components that are at the core of the privilege that you need to check off in order for the privilege to be engaged. And finally, we'll consider the limited circumstances in which the privilege uh, will be set aside by the courts. So first, let me start with a few very basic things. Uh, and the first is never to confuse uh, legal advice privilege with confidentiality. You never want to do that. They are two different things. A lawyer may be under an ethical obligation to keep everything confidential. I'm not concerned with that. That's much broader than privilege, which is a legal rule that has sp uh, specific conditions and requirements. Number two. Legal privilege, as you will see, is very close to being sacrosanct. It is really regarded as the most important privilege we have. It's exceptionally broad, and courts will always err on the side of inclusion. I don't want to let you think that anything that anyone ever says is going to be privileged will fall in, but I do know this. Where courts are uncertain, they will err on the side of inclusion. So what I'm about to tell you is good law, and I will tell you situations in which something is not necessarily privileged. But always keep in mind that for cases that fall close to the line, generally they're going to err on side on protecting the privilege. And it's certainly the case that if a party wishes to challenge to get something admitted on uh, from an opposing party that has the look of privilege, for example, if it's in the lawyer's file, that's generally going to be regarded as privilege at first instance. Um, again, not to say it'll never be overcome, but the starting point is privilege. This is the strongest privilege that there is. The other privileges uh, I will examine in subsequent capsules do not have that sort of onus. They don't uh, weigh that heavily in favor of keeping the privilege to start with. But legal advice privilege does, and here's why. You simply cannot have a legal system that's going to operate properly if clients cannot speak freely to their lawyers. It's part of the idea of getting access to justice. We believe that justice is complicated, and we believe that lawyers need to be able to help clients in need privately. Otherwise, you're going to really be worried who's going to go confess a crime to their lawyer to take a worst-case scenario if you know your lawyer can be called as a witness against you. And this is true across the board. It doesn't really matter what field. It's not as if you go speak to a criminal lawyer and that'll be held with greater confidence than if you just go speak to a real estate lawyer. The courts don't distinguish. Any advice you seek from a lawyer in any circumstance tends to fall within the scope of the privilege. And it's that desire for clients to be free and open that is at the core of the privilege. And that is one of the reasons, don't ever forget, that the privilege belongs to the client. It is the client who gets to choose whether or not the privilege should be set aside as long as the information is properly privileged and it doesn't fall into one of the limited exceptions. Very, very important. Now, a basing starting requirement for any communication that's going to be claimed 
between lawyer and client is confidentiality. Confidentiality is at the core of the privilege, and I said before that confidentiality is broader than privilege, but it is also a necessary precondition of the privilege. If you don't have confidentiality, you do not have privileged information. That's true at the back end as well. If somebody gives you a legal opinion and you, you know, leave it lying around your office or you leave it, you know, out in plain view for people to see, you've lost that confidentiality and you've essentially said, I don't believe this needs to be kept privileged. Now, let me be clear. Don't, don't overread what I'm saying. Sometimes things are accidentally lost. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about clearly lost. Um, also, don't think it has to be actually confidential. I may have a phone call with my lawyer and the police may be engaging in a wiretap uh, of my phone. I can promise you that even though the phone call is not actually confidential, as long as I had a reasonable expectation of confidentiality, I'm in, and I have to be. You can't just get around the privilege by breaching confidentiality. Otherwise, every time the police executed a search warrant and grabbed documents from a lawyer, they'd be able to say, well, it's not confidential anymore. That doesn't make any sense. Confidentiality or an attempt to maintain confidentiality is essential, but obviously uh, it doesn't extend to situations in which confidentiality is accidentally or deliberately breached by another party. Now, confidentiality is a good point, a uh, good point to talk about uh, an aspect of the privilege that can be a little bit interesting. And look at this situation. And what we have here is a situation in which here's the the client and the lawyer, and you've got other people that are present. And in the ordinary sense, you might think this is not confidential. And it is true that if this uh, conversation took place in an elevator and Johnny runs in and doesn't try to be confidential, this statement itself might not be covered by the privilege. Obviously, if the client didn't care enough to keep it confidential, then it shouldn't necessarily be privileged. But obviously, things are a little bit more complex than that. Obviously, lawyer-client confidentiality is not restricted to direct communications of lawyers and clients. Obviously, lawyers work with people in their office, and the confidentiality extends to them as well. The more interesting thing is this uh, relationship, the situation in which the client has people with whom they are working in what is called interest. And you will often see this referred to as common interest privilege. I don't actually think it is a separate form of privilege. It simply recognizes that lawyer-client or legal advice privilege can extend to people who you are working with. And the reason for that is simple. Obviously, the world doesn't operate in a situation where I am an island and I meet with my lawyer alone in every circumstance, especially in the context of complex commercial relationships. It is not uncommon for people to work together. And the court recognizes that confidentiality continues to exist where parties work together in common interest. And the basic rule of thumb is you are always allowed to share your confidential communications that you've had with a lawyer with people who are common in interest. Now, there are a couple of interesting particularities about that. So a privileged statement that is shared with or made in the presence, because sometimes you'll get an opinion from your lawyer, you know, this is an assault situation, but imagine it's a business relationship, and Johnny and um, uh, Phil are in a business commercial relationship. They share the documents. They're allowed to do that. They may be co-defendants in litigation. They are always allowed to share documents. The common interest remains, and the privilege remains in place. So as long as the other conditions of privilege exist, we're all good to go. Here's the interesting part of what's called the common interest privilege. If these two have a falling out, they cannot use privilege against each other. And this will often happen. So imagine here's the lawyer, and they're involved in some sort of commercial arrangement. So they get, in, they get, um, they speak to the lawyer. They're in common interest together, and everything's hunky dory. But at some point, the commercial relationship falls apart, and now Phil and Johnny, Phil wants to sue Johnny. Well, at that point the privilege cannot be upheld. And the reason for that is they don't have relative confidentiality, which means that between each other, there was no confidential communication that's worth protecting. So therefore, any documents prepared by the lawyer by uh, in, in relation to interests held by both Johnny and Phil 
can never be upheld. The privilege stops right there. So if they have a falling out, they can't claim privilege against each other in subsequent litigation. Interesting thing about this is they can claim privilege against the rest of the world. And that has to make sense to you. I mean, this is just quite obvious when you think about it. So these two cannot claim the privilege against each other. That's obvious because they never had confidentiality against each other. But against the rest of the world, they did have confidentiality. And the reason that's so important is because... You know, Phil may decide, okay, I'm going to align myself with everybody else. I'll leak this document to the rest of the world. And then the rest of the world would be able to use Johnny's hidden thoughts against him. That cannot be the case. The confidentiality uh, aspect of privilege only exists or only is vitiated when there is no confidentiality to protect. Against the rest of the world, there always was a nice little barrier. So one party cannot suddenly leak the information to somebody else and say, well, now use it to go get Johnny. Doesn't work that way. Now, keep in mind what we've already said. Obviously, for a privilege to occur, we've got to have a couple of things. So we've got to have a client and we've got to have a lawyer, and we've got to have a communications confidential. Those are key things. But we also have to have the other key part, which is that the communication is made for the purposes of seeking legal advice. So imagine that Johnny comes in and has a, bar, a beer with uh, his lawyer and says this, I've got a great stock tip by Big on Enron, and he's charged with some sort of stock fraud. Is this admissible? Arguably it is. There's no, there's no belief that these two are meeting in a situation in which legal advice is the purpose of the communication. So therefore, you know, a lawyer is not immune from giving evidence. If you're a lawyer, and many of you watching this capsule, or most of you will become lawyers, it doesn't mean that anybody who ever talks to you is, uh, is giving evidence that is covered by privilege. The communication has to be given for the purposes of seeking legal advice. And this can get very complicated, especially where lawyers are acting in commercial capacities. Lawyers act as trustees, directors, I've joked, babysitters, business advisors. It is not always clear that every communication made with a lawyer will be found to be in a legal capacity. And where appropriate, courts will scrutinize that. They will look at why did the lawyer get that communication? Why did the lawyer make that communication? If it's appropriate, they will dig behind and decide whether or not the precondition of the privilege is met. Because obviously, the whole goal of protecting lawyer-client communications is to allow people to seek out their legal remedies, not their commercial remedies. Where the matter's contested, the court will look at the whole relationship and try and make a decision. And once again, they tend to apply privilege broadly. If there's any connection, they will tend to privilege the communication. Another interesting issue is the extent to which communications that are part of a valid lawyer-client relationship are going to be privileged. In a very important decision from the Supreme Court of Canada, the court obviously, again, erred on the side of privilege. If you have communications part of a valid lawyer-client relationship, we're going to presume them to be privileged. But obviously, there are exceptions to this. Lawyers sometimes send clients information and vice versa that's not really sent for the purpose of obtaining legal advice. There have been some really interesting jurisprudence on things like trust accounts and the amounts that are transferred or in the real estate context, you know, letters reporting deeds of sale or the deeds of sale themselves or simple reporting letters from lawyers saying that a transaction's been completed. There have been a lot of arguments in these cases that this information could be very vital to a particular investigation or claim, and there, there are questions about the extent to which information of this nature falls within the privilege. Again, what I'm telling you here is 95% of the time it's going to be yes. There will be some transactions or communications that fall on the margins, but by and large, it's up to the opposing party to show that the purpose was not legal advice, and that's not easy to do. How important is the privilege? As I said earlier, it belongs to the client. The lawyer cannot release it of their own accord. It also lasts for life and death. The estate steps into the shoes of the client in most cases, and it's very, very hard to set aside privilege even where the client dies. As I said earlier, it is a system-wide privilege. And what I mean by that is, don't be fooled by the fact that the client is going to speak to their lawyer about a real estate transaction. 
It doesn't mean that the real estate advice that is given by the lawyer only applies to that real estate. For example, the Crown might find, hmm, he was trying to buy real estate. That's useful to our fraud investigation. Doesn't matter. The privileged information is system-wide. It doesn't matter how important it is. We've had many cases where the Crown has tried to seek information in the hands of a lawyer because it would show a motive to kill someone. I mean, murder. If I can show that I was going in business transactions that were failing and I was discussing these with my lawyer, that might be incredibly useful information in a murder prosecution. It doesn't matter. The privilege is system-wide. It makes no difference that the effect on the real estate transaction would be small and the utility of the information to the Crown would be large. Courts don't care. The privilege is system-wide. As with any privilege, there are exceptions, but they are very, very narrow. Number one, there is statutory repeal by express or necessary implication, but I can tell you it is very hard for Parliament to repeal legal advice privilege for a couple of reasons. First, the case law has made it uh, absolutely clear that there's got to be a clear intention to eliminate privilege. Parliament has to say this, does not, this legal advice privilege does not apply here. Any general rules of disclosure that say a person must turn everything over in their possession do not apply to legal advice privilege material. And moreover, legal advice privilege has been defined as a rule of fundamental justice. So there have been many statutory provisions that compel lawyers to turn things over, and they've been struck down under the Charter. Some have been upheld, but many have been struck down. That's how difficult it is to restrict legal advice privilege. An exception that does come up from time to time is something called the future crimes exception, although you could argue that this is not an exception at all on the basis that information of this type really doesn't fall within the privilege. Effectively, the future crimes exception exists where the client is attempting to use the lawyer to commit a fraud or a crime. And what I mean by that is very, very specific. It means that you are essentially knowingly committing a criminal or fraudulent transaction and using the lawyer or abusing the lawyer to get this done. Now that is not a legitimate use of privilege, which is why many people say this isn't an exception. It's just not privileged advice at all. Let me be clear about the future crimes exception. Number one, the lawyer doesn't have to know, obviously, that this is being used. The intention is the client, where the client has an intention to commit a fraud or a crime. Second of all, don't be confused about the client trying to avoid a crime or speaking about a crime. If you think about it, most criminals who go speak to lawyers are talking about past crimes. They're confessing to them. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about situations where the client is really trying to use the lawyer for a fraudulent or criminal purpose. In those circumstances, this will not apply. And I would also add that it's a, there are a lot of situations in which the client is going and trying to find out if something is illegal. And they're, trying, they're not sure. So they're, they're asking their lawyer for advice about things that turn out to be illegal. That's not future crimes. That is a client actually trying to get legal advice. And by the way, even if the client goes out and does what the lawyer told them not to, even if it's illegal, that also doesn't matter. The question is whether there was an intention to use the lawyer to commit a fraud or a crime. Very narrow exception. There are two other general exceptions that almost never, never arise. I've only seen incidences of them once or twice. Public safety, so where someone believes that this communication indicates that the, the client is going to do something criminal, like blow up a building, kill somebody, you know, and for some reason they're confessing to their lawyer. Well, there's an exception under the public safety exception uh, created at common law. Innocence at stake is also a very narrow exception, essentially where one person becomes aware that another person has said something to a lawyer that would get them out of a crime, they can use the innocence exception to have that produced. The requirements for the innocence at stake exception are, ex are really, really onerous, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's a very rare thing. Good to know about, but pretty rare to use. But I want to focus on the remaining part of this capsule on the exception that does come up the most frequently, waiver. Unfortunately, the rules governing waiver are exceptionally complex, so I'm going to give you the basics, what I call waiver 101. 
First of all, the client can always expressly waive the privilege. That's not difficult. As long as they know what they are relinquishing, they can waive. And sometimes they do so. Sometimes it's in their interest to waive privilege because it will reveal information about what they were doing and it's not too prejudicial to their interests. The hard part, as I've indicated in these little sub thing, is who is the client? Yikes, that can be troublesome. Sometimes you have group clients uh, where you have, you know, a board of directors and one director decides, I'm going to waive privilege and goes off and starts speaking to the media. Yikes, we'll leave those for a separate capsule one day. The harder part is that privilege can be implicitly waived and there are a number of situations in which this can take place. But I want to give you the golden thread. And the golden thread of all these situations of waiver is where it would be unfair to keep the privilege because of something the client did. The client did something that suddenly makes it unfair. Let me show you the easiest situation of unfairness that makes sense. We have the lawyer and client have a falling out, and the client wants to sue the lawyer for professional negligence. Naturally, the lawyer's de defense is dependent on showing the legal work that they actually did. And would it make any sense if the client, who owns the privilege, of course, could object to the admission of the opinion on the grounds that it's privileged? Of course not. It would make no sense whatsoever. The lawyer needs to be able to defend themselves by showing the communications that took place. So therefore, an attack on the lawyer usually amounts to a waiver of any privileged material that's relevant, keep in mind, that's relevant to showing the lawyer's good faith and um, acting within the grounds of their retainer. Without question, the most complex waiver issue is what's called state of mind. And it is complex because a lot of people claim it in situations where it shouldn't really exist. It's an important one to remember. It's not actually dissimilar to what we just did with the lawyer. If you make the legal advice a relevant area of the dispute, you can't claim privilege. And therefore, you know, you sue the lawyer. The, the, the legal advice that was given is a relevant area of dispute. But this occurs in other situations that are harder to resolve. So, for example, A sues B, and A says B was negligent, and B says, well, I wasn't negligent. I acted exactly as my lawyer told me to. Oops. You think it's fair to retain privilege in those situations? Generally speaking, if the person makes their legal advice a key aspect of the complaint, you can't claim privilege. How is A supposed to uncover, well, wait a minute, you're telling me the lawyer told you to do this? I need to know what the lawyer said. Did you follow their instructions? That will determine negligence. Now let me say, I am describing this in the most simplistic terms. State of mind claims are incredibly difficult because you'd be amazed how often A tries to push B into saying, my lawyer was the cause of my negligence. And the case law generally says you cannot be forced into waiving privilege. You can't be peppered away. In other words, if the client does not want to rely on legal advice as a reason for their innocence or their lack of liability, you can't force them to do it. You can't just say, well, did you speak to a lawyer? Yes, I did. That does not waive. That does not put your state of mind in issue. Speaking to a lawyer is what people do. The only time state of mind comes up is where your legal action, the relevance of your particular action, depended upon advice received from a lawyer. If that's the case, then you may be forced to waive the communications in question. Another fairness situation that comes up from time to time is what I call the some means all exception. That's just my own wording for it. But essentially, again, that's not too complicated either. Essentially what happens, this is what arises where someone wants to drip feed certain information that's helpful to them. So we say, well, sure, we will waive this opinion we had with our lawyer. It shows how we acted in good faith. We spoke with our lawyer and they told us to do this. But there are three other opinions that were given around the same time that they don't want to release. That can't go. The court will say, well, wait a minute. There are other opinions that buy on this. Once you've waived one, they'll consider whether you've waived all if they need to give a full picture of what happened. And I will finally touch very briefly on one other type of confidentiality that is sometimes referred to as waiver. What happens where you accidentally email an opinion to the other side? Oops. Well, you've lost confidentiality. By and large, most provinces and courts in those provinces accept that accidental disclosure is not a loss of privilege. And the Law Society Code of Alberta, Code of Conduct, makes clear that you've got to at least advise the opposing lawyer 
<laughs> note that it doesn't say whether privilege is waived. But you've got to sold it aside and let the court resolve the accidental disclosure issue. Usually, where a party seeks to get that information back immediately, they will say that privilege has not been lost. However, if a party is cavalier about it and lets it go on and doesn't seek to get it back, the court will say, well, obviously you don't care about it and confidentiality is lost. I will also say that I'm summarizing, again, a fairly complex issue. Different courts have come to different resolutions on this. Some courts have suggested that loss of confidentiality equates to loss of privilege. I personally think that's wrong. I think it's the client's privilege, and if lawyers lose the documents accidentally, that shouldn't affect the privilege status, and most courts tend to agree with that analysis. But I will advise you it's not crystal clear on that particular point. So that was a bit of a lengthier capsule today, but hardly surprising when you're dealing with one of the most important evidentiary rules that the legal system has. I hope you got the necessities of this privilege out of this capsule and understand the importance which this privilege actually has. In any event, that's more than enough for today. I hope you enjoyed this capsule and have a great day. To learn more about this topic, you might want to check out my book, The Law of Witnesses and Evidence in Canada published by Thomson Reuters. This book covers every topic involving the law of evidence and also how witnesses come before courts and tribunals in criminal, civil, and administrative proceedings. To learn more, you can check out my website at petersankoff.com.